Welcome back to the 42nd week of the I Thirst follow-up. Let's begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So today we are beginning the commandments, and we will speak about the first commandment. And the first commandment has different reiterations, first in the book of Exodus, and then in the book of Deuteronomy. The one in Exodus is very full, so we'll speak about this one. It goes like this, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall make, not make for yourself a graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord, your God am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands, to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Right. So usually when we think about the first commandment, we just think about don't worship any other gods, right? Or there's only one God. So the first commandment basically is that. But here, the kind of fleshed out version is important to really meditate on because when there is a principle, if we deviate from the principle, we get into a really big trouble, right? So for example, if you're just off by a little bit when you shoot your rocket into space, you know, you say that, you know, you have this like rocket here, right, on your space station and you just like shoot it a little bit, right? If you're just like a point zero 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 one off, it's going to be a big problem in the end because that little difference will just send you like really way off into, you know, la la land, you know, if we don't get it exact. And so a little mistake at the beginning, right, at the beginning will lead to a ginormous mistake at the end, right? So here, that's why we've got to really be careful with our principles, that is the beginnings of things. If you make a really big beginning, like if you don't learn your alphabet correctly, it's going to be hard to read at the end, you know, uh, Tolstoy or, you know, whatever you want to Dostoevsky or whatever it is, it's going to be impossible. So here, a big mistake at the beginning really leads to a lot of consequences at the end. And so when we really think about this, right, the first commandment is about there being one God. And so if we start to believe that there are multiple gods, right, then that's going to be a big problem. And so our Lord is very insistent, right, that of course there's one God. I'm the one who did everything for you. I led you out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods. And then you can see why the next part of the commandment is important because we cannot make a graven image, right? So these are kind of the effects where if there's one God, right, um, then here we have a God who is purely spiritual, that we should not make a graven image and worship that image. It's a very important thing, right? Uh, a lot of Protestants misinterpret this statement here. Um, and also the Muslims also misinterpret this when our Lord says that you should not make a for yourself a graven image, right, or any likeness of things in the heaven, on the earth, or under the earth, right? Here, it's very important to understand that we should not make that graven image and then worship it, right? The whole context of the first commandment is about worshiping the one true God, right? So the whole thing about graven images is that obviously people make them and then they worship them, <laughs> Okay, it's very important that actual image is worshipped. We cannot do that because we cannot worship 
matter. We cannot worship a piece of gold or a piece of wood that can be eaten by termites or, you know, gold that can be melted down or something like that. We cannot worship that. We worship the true God who is pure spirit. And so when we hear, for example, that Protestants say, oh, you use statues of Mary and you use statues of Jesus and, you know, here that's why the cross should be bare because there's a graven image. You shouldn't put Jesus on it or he's already resurrected. Why do you put Jesus on the cross, you know? And then for the Mohammedans or for the Islamic people, they don't in their mosques put any statues of Muhammad or anything like this, but they only decorate everything with just letters and beautiful calligraphy. Here, you know, they're reading this first commandment and they're not understanding that it's the context that you're not supposed to worship the graven idols. It doesn't say don't make any imitations at all because in the Old Testament, it's very clear that our Lord said, make cherubim. <laughs> Right, this is really clear. On the Ark of the Covenant, on the Ark of the Covenant, you are supposed to have two cherubim. Well, how are you going to make those cherubim not like material images? Okay, Carve these cherubim, right? How is that possible if you're not going to use material things in order to have these two cherubim which are looking down on the mercy seat, which is empty because obviously our Lord is going to be sitting there on the mercy seat, right? The seat of mercy. Um, here we see that the mercy seat also is an imitation of Our Lady, right? All of these are, you know, prophecies of further things. But here there's these two angels, right? How are you going to do this, right? You're going to have these two angels, and the only way you're going to do it is make a likeness of these angels. Obviously, the angels, they don't have wings. You know, there's a lot of these weird TikToks on, like, you know, this is how an angel looks like. And, you know, they're taking the metaphors and kind of just drawing them out. So you have these kind of weird, like, creatures that kind of come out and they're just getting all these you know views because they're so strange and all obviously everybody wants to know what an angel looks like but here you know we have to see that an angel is a, an immaterial being it's a spiritual being and so they don't really have wings wings are just a metaphor of their ability to really transcend and go higher just like birds are higher above us because they can fly and we see that in this case with regards to um, God right or here the angels the cherubim here that he commanded that when you build the Ark of the Covenant you're to make these images right so it's not wrong to make an image of an angel right because the God of the Old Testament who is God is the same God as the New Testament right when he says make a cherubim he's not contradicting himself the first commandment is all about, of course, graven images which we worship, okay? And then we have the kind of last part where that if we do, it's this warning that if we do worship, you know, the false gods, right? Some strange god, right? It's strange because it is not the real god, right? It's strange alternate, you know, reality that we've made up in our heads. It's, that's why the word strange is very, is a foreign god, right? It's not god because there's only one god. Here, then, there is going to be punishments for this. That's why when we think about it, it's very important that we see that if we don't worship the true God, the ramifications are huge, right? And that's why when our Lord says there will be punishments to the third and fourth generation, we see that that's really actually kind of merciful, right? If you think about not worshiping the true God, the ramifications of that are infinite because you just said, uh, I reject infinity over here. I reject infinite goodness. I reject this, you know, I reject the infinite God. And, you know, I'll just make up my own notion of God and have, you know, these, you know, gods with six arms or something like that, you know, or a God with an elephant face or something like that, right? So I just rejected the infinite God and I'm going to teach this to my family. And here, that's not going to have a bad effect. You know, here to have such a foundational thing just 
not be there in somebody's life. It really changes everything. And so, for example, atheists, right, if they, you know, say that there's, obviously they say there's no God, and then they teach their children, you know, oh, there's actually no God, you know, who who made the trees in the sky? It's all random, you know, it's just, just plopped together by different forces. There's just that just wreaks havoc on, on a little child's in, intellect. And here, it's not true, obviously. And we see that uh, when they look at things, there's going to be a disconnect because everything is so beautifully fitted together, but yet, you know, mommy or daddy just told me that everything was just randomly put together by the forces, cold forces of science. And um, that's what I believe, you know, <laughs> because that's what mommy and daddy taught me. That's going to mess with people's heads, you know. It's not just like, oh, you can choose whatever you think. It doesn't have ramifications on us, right? To have that kind of cold view of how nature fits together is just really, it's actually very damaging. And so when our Lord says there will be punishments in the third or fourth generation, there, what he's saying is that actually that's a consequence of, you know, rejecting the very foundational principle that there is one God, one true God. And so here, when we think about the first commandment, we indeed have to see that now the first commandment obviously don't have anything to do with any foreign gods. They're actually all demons. Okay, So here, anything that, um, you know, when these people were worshipping, you know, these statues, you know, obviously, you know, there was a demonic presence, uh, you know, there. And if the statue did something like seemingly miraculous obviously it's not miraculous but something preternatural like above our nature right then here that obviously is a demon and when we look at the former civilizations and we're kind of like making fun of them how could they like worship these weird gods you know um, and how could they do that you know these Aztecs worshiping the moon goddess or the serpent, serpent god or whatever here if we really look at the new age stuff and the witchcraft and all of these things it's really all the same kind of things like the paganism the druids and all these kind of things naturalistic things it's all another manifestation of demonic forces that here you know you're worshiping the sun or worshiping the moon how could you worship the sun how could you worship the moon well actually people are really coming back to that very clearly you know when they're saying oh you know you know gods in everything you know so that's why i worship everything you know or here just to say that there's this energy that's going out throughout the entire universe and you know this positive energy you know i have to make sure everything's right in my body so that all the energy is aligned or you know my chakras are all aligned or whatever these energy forces etc and then you just have all these things it's really all the same kind of thing because energy is basically just demonic forces <laughs> and we indeed have to see that we cannot engage in any superstition whatsoever. We cannot play Ouija boards. We cannot play even, there's like this Holy Ghost, you know, board game or the Holy Spirit board game is not the Holy Ghost, right? Here it's the, you know, they call it the Holy Spirit board. And it's basically the same thing because, you know, what spirit are you invoking? And they don't even know that it turns out to be a demon. And so any kind of superstition, any kind of tarot cards, any kind of Reiki, chakra balancing, or New Age sage blessings, or crystals, all of these go against the first commandment. Because basically there is a worship of this energy, right, which is here a graven image. And the true God is just kind of being cast aside. He is infinite love, infinite power. And here we are trusting in these like, you know, crystals, you know, to protect us. And we see that this inanimate object or, you know, this, um, you know, demonic force who might help us in the beginning, but only to enslave us in the end and then trap us so we can get out of its clutches. You know, we see that um, that's, uh, going to be something which is going to be very punishing on the person as well as further generations. You know, there are very scary stories of, you know, um, Satanists who have consecrated their child to Satan. And the child, of course, doesn't want any of this, doesn't know anything. 
But that action has consequences on the child. And we can't just say like, oh, it doesn't do anything. It's like, oh my gosh, if you really realize, you know, that, you know, that sin is so huge, it can affect any, everybody, you know. So, for example, if one person cheats in the class, you know, that sin of cheating doesn't just affect that person. That sin of cheating spreads to the entire class in a certain way because other people are like, well, if he does it, I can do it. Or for the good people, they're like, oh, why do I have to study this hard because everybody's cheating? So I might not cheat, but then it just spreads everywhere. Like a sin is not just something that stays with a single person. This is a really important thing that we have to realize, but it spreads everywhere, you know, and so here we see that, you know, if we make this mistake here and we start worshiping these other gods, right, uh, it really passes on to the children and can have a big effect. And so this then expands to, for example, the worship of money or the worship of power or the worship of self, you know, all of these things we make into graven images and all of those things, they redound to our children, right? It redounds to future generations so that if the dad or the mom is constantly worried about appearance or power or job or something like this, it will seep into the children whether the children want it to or not, right? It's just going to be in there and there's going to be a lot of ramifications to the third and fourth generation. So we really see that God is actually quite merciful to stop it there because these things could be just continuously passed down, you know. And so we really have to see that we have to stick with God, right? The one true God. When we do that, everything is beautiful, right? When we don't and we start to substitute money, pleasures of this world, drugs, relations, all of these, you know, things that we uh, would just want to do it for ourselves to satisfy our own selfish desires and not let them serve God. Obviously, money is not evil in itself, right? Relations are not evil in themselves, right? But we always have to do it according to God's rule and the natural law, all of these things. But here, when we start to just use it for ourselves and our own entertainment and here just use it for selfish means, it just causes a whole world of problems and and it doesn't stop with us. It just passes on to all those around us and especially our children. And so here, let us worship the one true God and see how important it is to know that one true God. We have to study our catechism. We have to know who this God is, right? The God who is infinite love and who sent us his son, who gave us the Blessed Virgin Mary, who created the whole hierarchy of angels, who gave us all these saints, who shapes history, gives us the Eucharist. We have to know who this God is because if we don't, there are huge ramifications and our life is basically going to be very messed up in disorder. If we know who God is and love him accordingly, this is what God wants from the first commandment. He wants us to love truth, right? He wants us to love beauty. He wants us to love goodness. He wants to love he wants us to love all the things that should be loved. And if we don't do that, the other option is falsity, lies, deception, right, evil, right, and here we just have a really ugliness of soul, that's the other option. And so here, the first commandment, even though it's like obvious, you know, to some people, it's just, you know, we just like, oh, yeah, there's only one God. But if we realize, really realize what it means to worship the one true God, right, that is something that we must do and what we must really see. And we must indeed uh, teach all around us, especially our families, how to worship the one true God. That is, go to Mass on Sundays, go to confession, do not receive Holy Communion in the state of mortal sin, right? Go to confession first, receive Holy Communion with all of our hearts, read the lives of the saints, all of the teachings of the church, follow the example of the saints, right? To be strong Catholics, right? All of that is included in what it means to worship the one true God. So let's pray that we can keep the first commandment with the love of the heart of Jesus within us. Amen.